Hello, good to see you, Pastor Sam, with a devotion from Genesis 45. We are going to be hearing today about Joseph. I'm going to move this a little bit. There we go. Uh, Joseph bringing his brothers, his family, his whole family, really, down to the land of Egypt. But we're going to be getting into this. This is a good um, chance for us to hear something kind of strange that Joseph says. He says, you brothers selling me into slavery was not something that you did. It was something that God did. And so we're going to really talk today about who gives us, air quotes, bad stuff who does bad stuff and and we're, we're gonna work through that question and kind of arrive at an answer joseph gives us the bare answer which is quite surprising to us and so I'm, i want to kind of talk through how how can joseph say this what does he know how does he understand things that maybe we don't quite see as clearly and can we get to be able to say the same thing and to have really the same confidence that Joseph has. That's what it's about. It's not really about uh, putting blame, least of all, on God. But it's about understanding that whatever happens to us comes from God and that he doesn't do it, he, he does it with a purpose. Let me say it that way. He does it with a purpose and that we can trust that his purpose is good. So we're gonna, we're gonna really kind of dig into that today. It's a very heavy question. And so we'll be spending, I'm sure, quite a bit of time on that. But we also hear about Joseph wanting his, his family to come down to Egypt. That's kind of the setting. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, ooh, all of Genesis 45. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and he wept aloud, so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me here before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, and go up to my father, and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt, and of all that you have seen. Hurry, and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon him, upon them. After this, his brothers talked with him. When the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph's brothers have come. It pleased Pharaoh and his servants. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, Do this. Load your beasts and go back to the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households and come to me. And I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you shall eat the fat of the land. And you, Joseph, are commanded to say, Do this. Take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives, and bring your father and come. Have no concern for your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. The sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh, and gave them provisions for the journey. To each and all of them he gave a change of clothes, but to Benjamin he gave three hundred shekels of silver and five changes of clothes. To his father he sent as follows, Ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, 
and ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and provision for his father on the journey. Then he sent his brothers away, and as they departed, he said to them, Do not quarrel on the way. So they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. And they told him, Joseph is alive, and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And his heart became numb, for he did not believe them. But when they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Now the actual uh, action of the text is pretty straightforward. And, and I was wrong before. I thought we were going to miss the big reveal that I was talking about in Tuesday's devotion, but here we are. Joseph reveals himself to his brother, says, hey, it's me, Joseph. And what I really want to focus on, we'll, we'll kind of come back, um, especially as they go back to their father, Jacob. I want to talk a little bit about that. But I want to spend some time on kind of verses 5 through 8. Because I think that's, that these verses are central to the life of Joseph and to being able, to really being able to understand Joseph's confidence, the confidence that he has, and uh, by very, by very easy extension, being able to frame our lives and the events of our lives and, and this secret that's really not a secret that Joseph has that, that unlocks how we deal with life. All right, uh, um, how do I want to do this? So I, I think I'm going to read verses 5 through 8 again because they're just really, really impactful. And then I kind of want to bring up something I did in a previous devotion because we're going we're gonna to dig deep into these verses. Joseph is saying to his brothers, now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Now, I said, I, I think it might have been last Tuesday or last Thursday's devotion, but it was it was when we kind of started talking about Joseph, and we had the devotion about him and Potiphar's wife. And and in that devotion, what I continually came back to is this idea of we love to separate things into good and bad. And we like the good things that happen to us, and we dislike the bad things that happen to us. That's natural. What I encouraged you to do, if you didn't watch that one, I would also encourage you to watch that one. This one is going to make a lot more sense if you watch that one first. What I encouraged you to do is to not waste time trying to determine if things are good or bad. What we saw in that devotion and what we've been seeing throughout Joseph's life is that things that we would call air quotes good and air quotes bad are, are connected, are, are vitally interconnected. So let's kind of think about Joseph's life. He is the favored son. He gets the coat of many colors that sends his brothers into jealousy. He has dreams on two separate nights in which his brothers bow down to him and he shares that dream with them. Their jealousy builds until they're so angry with him they want to kill him, but instead they throw him down a pit and then they sell him into slavery to some traveling merchants. Joseph gets to Egypt, is sold to a man named Potiphar, where God blesses him, and he rises to be uh, really come in, in charge of all of Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife sees that, wants Joseph to have sex with her. He refrains. She makes up a lie, gets Joseph sent into prison. While Joseph's in prison, he explains the dreams of two of Pharaoh's high-ranking officials, and specifically says, when you get out, remember me. Well, two years later, Pharaoh has a dream, and, and that one person who got out of prison, the other one died, finally remembers Joseph after two years of being in prison and says, hey, I know someone who can interpret your dream. Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream, 
says we need to stockpile grain because there's a famine, which we're seeing in our text. And Pharaoh's like, okay, you are number two in Egypt. You execute this plan. Uh, Joseph's brothers run out of grain because, of course, there's a famine. They come down to Egypt to buy grain. He gives them food and their money back. They come down a second time. He gives them more food and their money back again. And now, as we'll kind of get to in our text, the entire family is going to come down to Egypt and Pharaoh gives them the land of Goshen, which is the, the Nile Delta, the, the most fertile, the best land in the whole nation of Egypt. Joseph's family gets. And we're, we're so that's, that's kind of the story of Joseph's life. And if you take out, here's kind of the point that I made in that last devotion. If you take out any of the quote unquote bad things, it also ruins the good things from happening. So let's say, let's say Joseph doesn't get sold into slavery. He stays in Canaan. Well, let's, let's kind of play this out and see what would happen. Okay, Joseph doesn't go down to the land of Egypt. So he doesn't get thrown in prison. Okay, not, not going to prison. We would call that a good thing, quote unquote. But he's not there to interpret Pharaoh's dream. So Pharaoh has no idea about the famine coming up. So when the famine hits, Pharaoh and all of Egypt have no grain. Joseph's family has no grain either, because remember, no one knows this famine is coming, and everybody starves to death. The end. Is that a good story or a bad story? Well, I don't know. We took out a bad thing, so we would expect it to be a good story, right? Wrong. Wrong. Because we didn't take out a bad thing we screwed up God's plan. That's how we need to think about these things. We didn't take out a bad thing. We didn't prevent a bad thing from happening. We messed up God's plan. God had a plan. He knew exactly what he was doing. And he needed all of this to come through in its appropriate time to make his plan work. I, I need you to understand what we did. We didn't take out a bad thing. That's how we look at it. Oh, Joseph didn't get sold into slavery. We, we didn't take out a bad thing. We ruined God's plan. And the result was basically everybody died. That's really, really bad. Holy cow. So we took out one tiny bad thing and we have caused untold bad things to occur. Or, or... We can let God execute his plan, and lots of good stuff is going to happen. Hmm. Okay, let's think about that. I, I will give you an entire minute to think about that. Do we ruin God's plan and cause untold devastation? Hmm. Or do we let God do his job and have tons of good stuff happen? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. How much time do you, how much time do you need to think about this? Do we ruin God's plan and have tons of bad stuff? Or do we let God do what he's doing and have tons of good stuff? Hmm. I don't know. This one's really, really tough. I'm, I'm on the fence. I don't know. Okay, I can't be sarcastic any longer. Yeah, guys, come on. This, this is stupidly easy. Let God do his plan, right? Let God do his plan. So we didn't take out a bad, we didn't stop a bad thing. We actually stopped God. We stopped God. Think about that. We stopped God. That Don't ever do that. Don't ever stop God. That's, that's the absolute dumbest thing you could ever possibly do. Notice how Joseph reiterates this again and again and again. Verse 5, God sent me here. Verse 7, God sent me here. Verse 8, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Three times. He's like, guys, do you understand what's going on? God sent me here. God sent me here. God sent me here. Yes, things that we might call good, air quotes, and things that we might call bad, air quotes, happen. But that's irre the, the designation is irrelevant. right? Not, not that the things that happened are irrelevant, but us trying to determine if they're good or bad and then act upon that determination. That's what's irrelevant. Joseph didn't care. When he got sold into slavery, Joseph didn't care when the wife made up a lie and got him thrown in prison. Joseph didn't care 
when he when he sat there for two years because he knew this is the secret listen this is the secret joseph knew that god was carrying out his plan and that's all joseph needed to know did you hear that joseph knew god was carrying out his plan and that was it okay he didn't know the why he didn't know the when or the how or the who he didn't know any of those question words all Joseph knew was that God was doing his plan and that was it he was good with that okay this is a really easy application it's painfully simple it's so straightforward all you need I'm gonna wag my finger at you because we screw this up all the time all you need to know is that God has a plan and he will make it work period there we go 16 minutes nailed it that's it that's the secret it's a pretty easy secret it's not like seven steps to a whatever it's just God's in charge he's got a plan don't mess up with don't don't screw up his plan um, just let him do his plan right I don't know how much easier could it be let let God let God do what he knows is the best being a Christian is absurdly easy all we do is let God do all the hard work right it's absurdly easy and yet okay here's my concession um, how do I want to come at, I want to come at this a little bit different way okay I'm going to kind of back up and we're going to come around to this a little bit different way. We like to think, we like to think that God gives us the good things in our lives and that the devil gives us the bad things in our lives, right? The devil, the devil made me get cancer or the devil made me get that speeding ticket or the devil, whatever, the devil lied to me and so I did X, right? The devil made my loved one die, right? We, lo we love to say that um, because we can be angry at him. We can be like, oh, you stinking devil, right? You're, you're such a terrible. But really, that's a lie. And, and, and by making that lie, we actually give the devil way more credit than he deserves. Now, I, I know this is hard. God causes everything to occur in our lives as part of his plan everything with no qualifiers whatsoever god causes all of that to occur and that brings us to the difficult part of the christian life yes the christian life is absurdly easy sit back god's got a plan he's going to make it all work out but the christian life is also incredibly difficult because god's got the plan not you God works it out in his time, not in yours. And so you see things happening to you that you can't control, first of all. And so when, when, when we appear to lose control, we want to exert control in any way that we possibly can. Such as saying, oh, the devil caused this bad thing to happen. Oh, you stinking devil. And then we shake our fist and we feel better because we've taken back control and we can be mad at the devil for doing that naughty thing, right? No, it was really God who caused that event to occur as part of his plan. Because remember, remember the secret. Were you listening for the secret? God is making his plan work, period. And while you're in the midst of it, like, like think about if we pause at any moment in Joseph's life, as we pause on his way down to Egypt, as he'd just been sold and wrenched away from his family he didn't even get to say goodbye to his father right he just if we pause now it's not important to know what Joseph is thinking but we we can maybe suppose some thoughts that might cross our mind that's how we're gonna phrase it if I were in his shoes what might I be thinking wow this really stinks what are you doing God what like you're looking at your watch uh, you what about these promises of protection and love and care like it's it sure don't look like it right now or let's pause 
when Joseph's in prison for two years. Remember, that's one of those throwaway details that we miss. Joseph's in prison for two years. Let's, let's pause at the end of year one where there's no hope in sight, right? Like, uh, God, you know I'm still down here, right? What, what, are, what are you doing uh, any day now, right? Like, let's get things rolling. We, we got to come make this through. If we pause at any moment in the midst of Joseph's life, we are unable, I don't want to say this, um, we are unable to frame the events properly. Here's what I mean. Joseph's on his way down to Egypt. He's just been sold into slavery. He, we, we, we can't see yet the end result of that. We can't see God's plan being brought into action. Right? And Joseph actually tells us why these things occurred. Verse 5, God sent me before you to preserve life. Verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, to keep alive for you many survivors. It was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Remember before, if we take that one bad thing out, everybody dies at the end. So God caused that bad thing, bad, air quotes, remember, because good and bad are not important. God caused that thing to occur as an essential part of his plan. Without Joseph getting sold into slavery and being brought down to Egypt, the rest of his plan doesn't work. God needed that to happen because God sees this on a huge, he sees it on the forever spectrum of time. And he's like, I'm orchestrating all of these events for all of these people to make my plan work. And I've got the number one best plan, God says. God has the absolute best plan. And, and here's, here's the, so the, the Christian life is absurdly easy. Sit back and let God work his plan, right? That's it, period. That's, that's living the Christian life. Let God work his plan. The difficulty of the Christian life is when we pause along the way. Because we can't look back and see the whole thing yet. That won't happen until Judgment Day, until the new heaven and the new earth. That's when we can look back on the whole story and we can do what we're doing with Joseph here, right? We can look back at the end of Joseph's life and see, wow, through all of the events that God brought about, by the way, that God caused to occur in each of those events, God was making his plan work. We can see that for Joseph. When we get to Judgment Day, we can look back upon the entire history of creation and see, oh, wow, God actually knew what he was doing. He actually had a really intricate, uh, good plan. I can't think of any better words than good. An amazing plan. When we get, now, now, now this is kind of harder because sometimes, sometimes we can't. Sometimes we can't. We can look back as we're nearing the end of our lives. We may be able to, and that's the best I can give you, we may be able to look back and to see God was at work. To, to be able to see, we know he promises that he is at work, that he has been at work. So that's not in question. What is in question is our ability to perceive it. Are we able to perceive the ways in which God works because God works in a man getting sold into slavery. God works in someone lying about another person and that person getting thrown into prison. God works through dreams. God works through people who forget for two years. Right? God works through all, he works through anyone and everyone to make his plan work. That's the secret. That's the secret to life. God is making his plan work period. So the Christian life is absurdly easy. What, what do I need to do? I need to just let God make his plan work. Now the Christian life is incredibly difficult for the simple fact that God works through any and every situation. And some of those situations we like and some of those situations we don't like. 
But, but regardless of our reaction to them or our perception of them or our feelings about them, they are part of God's plan. I need you to hear that. All of the situations of your life are part of God's plan. Not just some of them, not just the ones we like, and, and the other ones are part of the devil's plan. That's not how it works. The devil's not in charge. God's the only one in charge. Everything that occurs is part of God's plan. What's the end result of God's plan? Well, to bring about your salvation, first of all, to bring about the salvation of many people, to bring about the, the re-perfection of this entire creation, to bring about the, the giving of eternal life to us. Those sound like good things, and they are good things. They're like immensely, immeasurably good, the best possible things that could ever occur. That's, that's what God is on track to accomplish that much he's told us where where the end of this is all headed he's revealed that to us and we're just we're just walking along right we got to get there now god has told us where this path leads where his plan ends and now we just got to get there we got to let him work today and tomorrow and the next day and the next year and the next millennium depending on when jesus comes back of course the christian life is absurdly easy because we let God accomplish his plan. Period. I kind of feel like I need to end. We're going to circle back to our friend Joseph. Now again, let, let me let me kind of wrap this up a little bit. Um, I, I say this not to demean anyone because we do wrestle with different things that occur in our lives. Um, the, 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 the only reason, my only intent in sharing this with you is to provide you with confidence. That is my sole intent in sharing this with you, is to give you confidence. You can trust that this is God's plan. His plan has a really good ending. So let's get there. We have to get there whatever way God has plotted, right? Whatever course God has set for us, that's the course. And we need to get there. We need to get to the ending. So regardless of what happens in your life, it's God's plan. It's part of God's plan. We need to get to the ending, and we will get to the ending. Because God is going to make sure that happens. Okay, my only, my sole intent in, in, in digging this deeply into it, and I'm, I'm sure that I've said some very difficult things, my only intent is to give you confidence in God. That is what I hope occurs as, as the result of this, that you are confident in God, that his plan is working. That's, that is what I want for you. Okay. Um, again, the, the action of the text is pretty straightforward. Joseph says, I'm Joseph. Bring, bring dad down here basically. And and Pharaoh's on board with this plan. Pharaoh's like, get donkeys and wagons and all that stuff. Because remember, Jacob's an old man. Um, some of you who have walked a ways in life might appreciate having some comfort on a long journey. I'm just going to say it that way. Okay, verse 26. They told Jacob, Joseph is still alive, and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And his heart became numb, for he did not believe them. Now remember, up till this day, Jacob has been led to believe that Joseph was killed by a wild animal. And so throughout this entire time, Jacob thinks that Joseph is dead. So now he hears not only that Joseph is alive, but that Joseph is the, the ruler of Egypt and that they need to relocate to Egypt. This is one of those moments. Um, this is like really good news, right? When you get really good news and you're just unable, it's so unexpectedly good that you're just like, what? I think I had something crazy in my ear. Could you repeat that? Right, this is... You come in, 
I've been using the can. I, there, there's been a lot of people with cancer on my mind lately, so that's kind of where my examples. Um, that's that's just why why a lot of my examples have that. Right, you go in for your second cancer screening, and they're like, "It's gone. This this is unbelievable. It's gone." And you're just like, "I'm sorry, what? This is incredibly good news that Jacob hears, and and he's just." Uh, his heart has been so filled with sorrow that the prospect of having joy and hope is is at first impossible to him. In verse 27, they told him all the words, he sees the wagons, and then he begins, because you don't, right, you hear the good news, and on one level you understand like, okay, your son is actually alive. He didn't get killed by a wild beast. Like, you you understand what those words mean, what those individual words mean. But then to put them all together and the, the, the result of how your life has been altered, that that is where the impossibility of hope comes. And, and you slowly kind of peel that away as you begin to allow yourself to have joy and peace. As Jacob hears and starts to process, okay, Joseph is alive. And that's what he says. It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. He's like, okay, this is really good news. I I never in my life believed I would get news like this. And, and now I'm starting to have hope. Now we're going to come back on Saturday. We're pretty much done with today. We, we again, dug very heavily into that issue of God bringing the events in our life. And, and it, it, is, uh, it can cause us to go all kinds of, of uh, harmful directions, right? So that, that's why I wanted to be just very straightforward with you. God brings all of the events in your life because they are part of his plan. And, and so what I want is for you to have confidence in God, that he is accomplishing his plan. And, and I think looking at Joseph's life is a really good way to do that because Joseph has very, very, uh, very high highs and very low lows, right? Hopefully higher and low, hopefully, hopefully at least lower than your lows, but maybe not. Maybe not. I don't know what has gone on in your life. And maybe you have had even lower lows than Joseph. Again, that's not what's important. What's important is that secret that Joseph knows, that he shares with us, that impossibly, that absurdly easy secret. God is accomplishing his plan. And that everything in your life is part of God's plan. That's an absurdly easy secret. Oh, okay. I just have to let God do his plan. Wow, how easy is that? Uh, as it turns out, very difficult, right? Very, very because we, because it's not our plan and we're not in control. And we, we're, we sometimes feel like a, a flag just flapping on the pole, right? Like all, all you're doing is hanging on. Yeah, some days that's probably it. Some days all you're doing, well, that's not entirely true. Some days all you're doing God is holding on to your hands and you're just flying out there, right? And God's got, and he's like, I got you, friend. I got you. I'm not letting go, right? I got you. You feel like you're flying, like, like every, but I got you, friend. I got you. And I, I'm going to pull you through this. We're, we're going to do this together. I'm going to do this for you. This is my plan. Keep coming. Come on. Keep coming, friend. That's, that's more what it's like. Um, okay. Hopefully that, hopefully that has begun to sink in and, and that you have grown in your confidence in God. That is my hope for you. So let's pray. Dear Lord God, you have the very best of plans. And I ask that you would give us all a confidence in you, Lord, knowing that you are in control, knowing that you are with us in each situation, no matter what happens to us in life, it is from your hand and that you are there to share your love and your strength and your encouragement with us. Lord, continue to keep us on your path. Continue to pull us forward each and every day. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen. Thanks for tuning in. This was uh, ho hopefully a very good encourage again. If it was good or bad, that's not the point. Hopefully it has, it has increased your confidence in God. There we go. That is my hope. Uh, come back on Saturday. We're going to have two people die in the text on Saturday. <laughs> Should make that clear. Um, and we're, we're, we're going to be wrapping up the book of Genesis, pointing forward. When we come back next week, <sighs> Exodus, oh, my favorite book. Perhaps. Well, uh, the Gospels are pretty good, but uh, Exodus is definitely top five. How about we just say that? Anyway, that's what's coming on Saturday. We're going to wrap up Genesis. Next week, we're going to be getting into Exodus. And then we'll be there for a few weeks, at least until Easter, which is actually coming pretty soon. <laughs> But then after Easter, too, we'll continue to be in the book of Genesis. So anyway, my point is lots of rambling. Come back next time. God's peace be with you. Good to see you, friend.